Sancho Sancho Father. Let us pray. What a mighty God we say. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we say. Hallelujah. worship that mighty God. Let's bless his holy name. Let's give him glory. Let's give him honor. He's worthy to be praised. we just want to bless your name. The God of Shiloh will bow before you. The ancient of days, the unchangeable changer, the one who was, the one who is, the one who is to come. Glory be to your holy name. Thank you for what you did on Tuesday. Thank you for what you did on Wednesday. Thank you for what you did yesterday. Thank you for what you're about to do tonight. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. Father, in all our lives tonight, show your glory. Show your power. Show your love. Show your favor. Show your mercy. Father, let this night be a night none of us will ever forget. 
At the end of everything, Lord, let your name be glorified. And once again, my Father and my God, I'm committing the leadership of this commission into your hands. Please take them from glory to glory, from power to power, from anointing to anointing, from joy to joy, and from victory to victory. And I pray that every one of us we will serve you wholeheartedly to the very end. Thank you, Almighty God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Oh, let someone shout hallelujah. Now, before you sit down, please shake hands with two or three people and say, God will be glorified in your life. Thank you very much, and then you may please be seated. And uh, the please be seated includes photogra photographers too. Uh, photographers are wonderful people, but uh, they can be a bit troublesome too. <laughs> I bring greetings from my wife, who really wanted. She really wanted to be here tonight, but um, some visitors who are coming for the Congress decided to arrive a bit too early. And so, and so they had to keep her at home. But she sends her love, and she's praying along with us here. The last time I was here, on my way home, I got a phone call from someone who was at this meeting, at the meeting then. And he said, Daddy, I have discovered that you love some children more than others. I said, how do you come to that conclusion? He said, by the time you finish speaking here today, I know that your love for Bishop Oyedeko is more than the one you have for me. All I could say is, Amen. <laughs> there are sons and there are sons. And I want to, I want to thank the Almighty God for my son, Bishop David Oyedepo. Uh, I can say it anywhere, I am very proud of him. And like he rightly said, in the olden days, one prophet had to die before another one would arise. But I thank God that in the New Testament it is different. I thank God that in my lifetime, I am already seeing the glory that will be after I'm gone. I want you to put your hands together for the Almighty, to the Almighty God, for our beloved Bishop. God bless you, sir. We are proud of you. And of course, beside every successful man is a successful woman. Will you please put your hands together for my daughter? I say, God bless you, man. God bless you, man. In order that I may not offend anyone, I will just say, may God bless all the other bishops. And I want them to know that I'm very proud of them also. Uh, and I hope the representative of our president will take our message back to him and let him know we are praying. And we believe that very soon all the afflictions of the righteous in Nigeria will come to an end. John chapter 5, verse 2 to 9. 
John 5, verse 2 to 9. Now there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew term Bethesda, having five porches. In this lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole, or whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Will thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another stepped down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on that same day was the Sabbath. There are certain words that are very difficult to define. As a mathematician, I am trained to define words because before you can solve a problem, the problem must be properly defined. And we will soon discover, as you go deeper in mathematics, that there are certain words that you cannot really define. When we say, for example, what is distance? You will get into trouble trying to define distance. Because we will say distance is the distance between two points. <laughs> and when we say, what is time? You have a problem defining time. You know how to measure time. But it is difficult to define time. If you want to be clever, you say time is a fragment of eternity. Then comes the question, what is eternity? And you say eternity is time without end. So what is time? Time is a fragment of time without end. So you discover that there are several things in, in life that we just use without being able to define them. What is speed? Speed is distance divided by time. But you can't define distance, you can't define time. So you can't define speed. But you know how to measure it. So many kilometers per hour. The same is true of the word called glory. It cannot be defined. I know there would have been several definitions given, but if you go deep enough, you discover that it's difficult to define glory. But then we discover that there are certain words that the best way to understand them is to talk about their opposite. If we say, what is life? Life becomes easy to understand when you say life is the opposite of death. Death is easy to define. When somebody is dead, we know he's dead. <laughs> and so to define glory, we have to look for the opposite. Unfortunately, the Bible gives us the opposite. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 35. Proverbs 3, verse 35, he says, The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. 
Now, when you write it, these two down mathematically, and you say wisdom is a function of glory, equation one. Shame is a function of foolishness, equation two. It becomes easy to solve. The conclusion is that the opposite of glory is shame. Ah. So once you know that glory is the opposite of shame, you're in business. Therefore, glory is the opposite of everything that can cause shame. And there are many things that are associated with shame. And all these things that are associated with shame, they are in the life of the man by the pool of Bethesda. I will mention some of them because we can't be here all night, particularly as I know that there is the anointing service very early tomorrow morning. Sickness. There's nothing glorious in sickness, particularly incurable sickness. Reproach. There's nothing glorious in reproach. Failure. It's difficult to see somebody, a student, who has just failed his exam, coming home shouting hallelujah. Defeat. There's nothing glorious in defeat. Anytime in those days when Super Eagles won a match, they would tell everybody when they will arrive. And people would line the street to welcome them. When they lose, they come in quietly. They arrive at night. There's nothing glorious in frustration. There's nothing glorious in sorrow. In fact, when somebody is sad, one of the ways we know is that he bows his head. Sorrow of heart makes the head droop. There's nothing glorious in stagnation. Nothing glorious in having been in a, the same position for years going around in circles. And believe me, honestly, there's nothing glorious in poverty. There's nothing glorious in bondage. There's nothing glorious in being demon-possessed. There's nothing glorious in loneliness. I can go on and on, but we won't be able to cover all the grounds. The Holy Spirit will help me to touch those that are very crucial. When Jesus visited the pool of Bethesda, he brought in waves of glory. And the waves of glory swept away everything that was causing shame in the life of that man. I am believing God for somebody here tonight that everything that is causing shame in your life shall be swept away tonight. Let me very quickly pick some of these things. Take sickness, for example. There's nobody who get up and say, Praise the Lord with me, I am sick. Because there's nothing to glory about in sickness. But thank God that the man who visited the pool of Bethesda that day, according to Exodus 15, verse 26, Exodus 15, verse 26, he is the Lord that healeth the great physician. 
Thank God that the God who visited that man on that day has adequate provision made for any form of sickness or disease. Because by 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, 1 Peter 2, 24, the Bible says, By his stripes you were healed. In Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52, Mark 10, 46 to 52, we have the story of Bartimaeus, that man who was born blind, sitting by the roadside begging. When Christ passed by, the wave of healing brought healing to that man. And one thing I know about God is according to Psalm 107 verse 20, Psalm 107 verse 20, the Bible said clearly, he sent his word and he healed them. I have good news for someone listening to me today, either here or in the various satellite stations. Even as the word of God is coming to you tonight, you will be healed in Jesus' name. When I visited America the first time in 1979, I went to Connecticut Committee and I saw God performing mighty miracles. On my way back in the plane, I said to God, I had the audacity of a child of God, young, zealous, maybe not too wise. I said to God, I said, if I get to Nigeria and I don't see you do what I've seen you do here in America, I will call you a racist. Thank God he didn't kill me. Because he knew I, I, I wasn't being rude. I just wanted to see his glory also in my nation. I came home called our little church there together then. I call it a healing service. And I began to lay hands, like I saw him, the man doing over there. And lo and behold, as I was laying hand on them, they too were falling on the ground, like I saw in America. And they got up and they got healed. But then, some people saw what I was doing and they began to copy. And when they lay hands on people and they didn't fall, they began to push them. <laughs> and at times, they will, at times, they will hold the head of the fellow they are praying for and shake it so violently, the fellow will say, all right, instead of breaking my neck, I better go down. Then one day, I went to visit somebody, and he was, somebody was laying hands on people, and as he was laying hands, he was putting his leg behind their legs, so that when he gives them the push, they can fall. So I said to God, God, there must be an easier way. And then he said to me, son, it is written, I sent my word and I heal them. He said, son, you speak the word and leave the miracles to me. Tonight, as the word is coming to you, receive your healing in Jesus' name. In the life of that man beside the pool of Bethesda, there was a reproach. A reproach is a problem that you can't hide. A problem that is prominent. Something as soon as people talk about you, they refer to that something in your life. The blind Bartimaeus. Even though he has received his sight more than 2,000 years ago, some people still call him blind 
that because that's the way of human beings. They want to use that thing in your life that is not glorious to describe you. Reproach, like in Second Kings chapter five, verse one. Second Kings chapter five, verse one. The Bible told us about all the beautiful things about Naaman, but he added the word "but." And that but destroyed everything else. The reproach in a man's life is that thing which is in your life that is causing people to say, where is your God? But I have good news for somebody here tonight. There is one of the waves of glory that can take care of reproaches. And every reproach in your life will be gone tonight in Jesus' name. I can give you several examples, but some of you probably have heard of this one. We had a Holy Ghost night at the National Stadium some years ago. And as I was preaching, the Lord spoke and said there was a man in the stadium who had a growth in his throat, big growth, and that the growth has gone. Now, the man was sitting high up in the stadium, and there was a sister sitting next to him. And because of the growth, this kind of growth is not the kind you can put under your collar. It was there. Sister had been looking at that growth with one eye all along. She didn't see the face of the man, but she saw the growth. So when she heard that the growth was gone, she turned immediately to see. And just like a bird, the growth has disappeared. She was so shaken that after the program, she trekked from Surulere to Pangroof before she remembered that her car was parked at the stadium. When God takes away your reproach, the Bible says we shall be like them that dream. There is someone here tonight. Every reproach in your life will be gone tonight. That man by the pool was a failure. He said so himself. He said, for 38 years, I have been trying and I've been failing. But a single wave from the Lord Jesus Christ put an end to his failure. Why? Because Psalm 46 verse 1, Psalm 46 verse 1 tells us that our God is the ever-present help in the time of trouble. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Philippians 4, verse 13, he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 7, Luke 5, verse 1 to 7, the Bible tells us that Peter fished all night and caught nothing. Peter was a failure until the king of glory brought in a wave of glory. And the man who was a failure became an instant success. I heard the bishop say in one of his tapes, I'm sure you don't know I listen to his tapes. I've told you if a pastor doesn't listen to a bishop, that pastor is in trouble. I heard the bishop say in one of his tapes, I think it was Shiloh 2009, 
He said, things don't work because you walk it. Things work because God walks with you. He, he didn't, you may not remember he said so, <laughs> but this pastor remembers. It takes the wave of glory of God to take a failure and turn him to a success. The Bible says, except the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain, they build it. From tonight onward, all your laboring in vain will come to an end in Jesus' name. You probably have heard the story of a young man that came to us years ago and said, Daddy, I want to build a house at the camp. I said, oh, fine, That's, you are welcome. He said, but please, I don't want my parents to know until the house is ready. I said, no problem, I can keep a secret. So he built a house, very magnificent house, it was the best house in the camp at that time. And then say, you can now send for my parents. When they come, tell them you want them to follow you somewhere. Don't tell them anything yet. I said, okay. So they came, and I said, they should follow me. We, they followed. We dedicated the house. After we finished the dedication, the boy signaled to me, said, now you can tell them. So I now congratulated them. I said, congratulations on your house. They said, which house? I said, this house. They said, we didn't build a house. I say it's built for you by your son. That's son, dad. And they were transfixed with wonder. You know why? Because at school, this son had failed again and again and again. Until one day, the parents said to him, you can become anything. Now, the one they said cannot become anything now has built a house for them. I have good news for somebody here today. All those who think you are a failure, God will surprise them. Another thing that brings shame is defeat. Like I said earlier, this man was defeated by forces stronger than him. Either somebody got into the pool before him or his sickness could not allow him to move fast enough. And the difference between failure and defeat is this. When you fail, you fail because you tried on your own and your effort was not enough. In the case of defeat, you fail because the enemy prevented you from succeeding. The enemy caused you to fail. And there are many of us who are here today who have not reached our goal because of enemies. Enemies in the father's house, enemies in the mother's house, enemies in husband's house, enemies from wife's house, enemies in the place of work. Today, the God I serve will take care of all your enemies. In Joshua chapter 7, if you read from verse 1 to 12, Joshua 7, read it from verse 1 to 12, you will see how an enemy can cause a man to fail. Joshua was doing God's will. In fact, God has just given him a mighty victory over Jericho because he obeyed God. But unknown to him, somebody in his camp has offended God and brought defeat to a whole nation. 
And the Ramesh said, what do you see? Joshua dream. When defeat came, Joshua couldn't lift up his head high. He fell on his face. Defeat has a way of bringing you down on your face. But then thank God that there is someone called the Lord of hosts. You see, when you read Psalm 27, uh, Psalm 24 from verse 7 to 10, Psalm 24 from verse 7 to 10, you will see that the one who is also called the King of Glory is also called the Lord of hosts. There is a God who has never lost a battle. There is a God who can deal with any enemy, whether in the air, on the land, in the sea, and underneath the earth. And that God has a promise for somebody. He said in Isaiah 41, from verse 10 to 13, Isaiah 41, verse 10 to 13, he said, ah, don't be afraid. He said, I will help you. He said, those who are incensed against you will be as nothing. He said, you will look for them and you will not find them. <laughs> Who is God talking to tonight? <laughs> if you are the one, let me hear you say amen. Lord, and pray. <laughs> A man will be defeated if he is fighting alone. But when the Almighty God is fighting for you, it becomes difficult to fail. I had an opportunity to talk to some big men at the United Nations some time ago to preach to them. And I discovered that everything I was saying was, uh, seemed to be falling on deaf ears. They don't seem to take me serious. And suddenly God gave me a word of wisdom. And I said to them, I said, uh, your excellencies, I used to be a boxer. I don't look like one now, but I used to be one. And I said, you must have observed something, that when boxers are fighting, they keep on aiming at the head of the opponent. I said, have you wondered why? Because the head is small, the belly is there, big, the chest is big, but they keep on aiming at the head. The head is small and the head can easily be moved. You can move it to the right, left, back, but they just keep on aiming at the head. Why? Because it, all they wanted to do is they want to land two blows, only two. One on the right eye, one on the left eye. Because they know if they can close your two eyes, you can't see. And you cannot defeat an enemy you cannot see. So if you can close the eyes of the opponent, then the opponent will be compelled to surrender. So I said to them, brethren, you are fighting an enemy you can't see. And to be able to defeat an enemy you cannot see, you need an ally that you cannot see. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. By the time I showed them one or two other examples and I gave the altar call, this time they were willing. Many of us are fighting enemies we can't see. Many of us have been defeated by forces that we cannot see. But as the Lord lives, because you have come to Shiloh, because God is coming with the waves of glory, every defeat in your life shall be turned to a testimony. One of my daughters came to us several years ago and said, Daddy, I need help. So what's the problem? She said, I've been fighting a battle with a woman over my husband for years. 
everything I could do to keep my husband, I did it, but the woman has won. I have been defeated. My husband has parked out of the house, left me with four children, to go and live with a woman with five children. <clears throat> she said, there's nothing more I could do. I've done my best. I said, no problem. I know a God who has never lost a battle. I said, your husband will come back to beg you. She said, ah, no, 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 I'm not asking him to come and beg. Just let him come back. I said, he will come and beg. And we prayed a simple prayer. I asked the Almighty God to start a quarrel between the husband of my daughter and the strange woman. A quarrel that nobody will be able to settle. Some days later, the strange woman said to the husband of my daughter, he said, stupid man. Ah, he said, what do you mean by I'm stupid? He said, ah, if your head is correct, how could you leave your wife with four children and come and stay with a woman whose children are not yours? He said, your head is not correct. The man said, you are correct. So he came knocking at the door. When my daughter opened the door, he prostrated. My daughter said, you don't need to worry, just come in. Every defeat that you have suffered up to this moment shall be turned into a testimony in Jesus' name. to tell you that there is nothing glorious in poverty. I'm sure in this commission we have no covenant with poverty. There are some people who believe that one of the ways to serve God is to be poor. But I'm sure we know better than that here. This building costs money. The university here, the landmark university, could not have been built without money. The great work that this commission is doing all over the world costs money. And in any case, if any of you don't like prosperity, all I want you to do is pray a prayer and say your own portion of the wealth of God should be sent to me. <laughs> because I can use it. I know what to do with it. But there is a God. Who said in Haggai chapter 2 verse 8, Haggai chapter 2 verse 8, he said, silver is mine, gold is mine. 